All right, so I start off pretty much every morning by I sit down with uh, you know this with a notebook that uh -huh. looks like this. It's you know it's got like it's got it's filled with this is intense. <laughs> what Valerie calls uh, my Unabomber scribbles, and uh -huh. um, and the, so this morning. I was, uh, you know, a lot of the time I, I write and I start to say something like, I don't have anything to say. And I feel like, you know, I'm totally ignorant and foolish. And then that leads to something. So this morning I ended up writing about um, the cave, you know, Plato's cave. And mm -hmm. we're, all, we're all in the cave, except then some exceptional people supposedly can leave the cave, like Socrates or Buddha. And they go out and see the, you know, the the sun of absolute truth, and then they try to go in and tell everybody inside the cave, and everybody inside the cave thinks they're an asshole and tells them to get lost. Okay, so I'm I'm sort of trying to figure out what's the cave and what does it mean to leave the cave? Is it possible to leave the cave? Is there a cave? And and then I suddenly this this memory popped into my head. You know, I lived in Denver from 75 to, to 1980, painting houses for a living. And um, toward the end of my time there, I'd already decided to finally go to college and I was going to move to New York. And I ended up in a uh, drinking with some friends. I ended up in a bar at, on the outskirts of Denver. And I can still picture it. You're, you're sitting at the bar, you're ordering your drinks or just sitting there drinking. And behind the bar was this giant aquarium and in it was this fish about like this big, a silver fish. And it was really weird looking. It was kind of beautiful. Its scales were very shimmery, uh, but it had this kind of like mean face and like a real severe underbite. Kind of like, like this. Actually reminded me of Bob Wright has a dog that looks like this really bad underbite. <laughs> he's a sweet dog, but he looks mean. He's like, Ugh. and this, this fish looked nasty. And also its eyes were really milky, milky white. Mm -hmm. And so it turned out that it was a, a blind piranha. You know what, you know what piranhas are? You yeah. Supposedly vicious yeah. fish. A blind piranha and, sounds like a, a good name for a band. <laughs> yes. And uh, it's definitely got some metaphorical resonance. And, and the piranha was, in addition to this, this kind of snaggletoothed underbite, it had a, like a big chunk of flesh on its bottom jaw. It was really weird looking, kind Shit. of sticking out. And I, I couldn't figure out what that was for. And then the guy behind the bar dropped some minnows into the aquarium and the piranha it could obviously, even though it was blind, it could sense them and it starts darting around the, the aquarium, bumping into the glass, kept missing the minnows. <laughs> and so this thing on its chin, I guess you'd call it, was from repeated bumping against the glass. Wow. The glass. Okay. And I, so I thought, okay, that's like, that's definitely a metaphor for humanity <laughs> <laughs> popped into my head this morning. And then I have this ritual with Valerie where I, I get up before her, I'm lying on the couch, I'm writing shit down. She's still sleeping. Then she comes out and gets me and we, we go lie in bed for a while and talk about stuff. And she said, well, what are you, you know, what were you thinking about this morning? And I, and I told her the story of the piranha and she went, why would you tell me that? <laughs> it's, it's just the re Usually she says that what I tell her is boring. She said, boring. Or, but this morning she said, that's horrible. Why would you tell me that horrible story? Now I'm going to not be able to get that stupid piranha out of my head. And I said, yeah, that's, that's the point. That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the relevance to the cave? How do you I connect think, to Plato's cave? I think, uh, you know, we all are kind of like that. Well, mm -hmm. one possibility is we're all like that piranha. We're in our 
in our um, our cell, and we're bumping into the walls repeatedly, and that's our little universe. Now here I am, a supposedly higher being, and I'm looking at the piranha. I'm outside of its aquarium, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so I'm I'm feeling superior to it, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I'm feeling pity for it. Like wow, things could be worse. I could be that fucking fish, <laughs> but. You know, if there's the possibility that there's a higher being or even other humans could be looking at me and thinking just what I'm thinking about the piranha. Like, look at that poor deluded right. fool in right. his little tiny aquarium of his belief system. He thinks he knows what's going on. He thinks that's the universe. He's chasing shit around, trying to catch some food just to survive, but he doesn't have a clue. Yeah, I, I actually was thinking about the, the metaphor of the cave recently in relation to uh, to the DMT experiences that I've had throughout my life. And uh, it, it just seems like a good, like the, the feeling when you are in that, you know, DMT hyperspace is that you're seeing what's been happening. It's It's yeah. not like you're you entered i mean it, different people report different ways of relating to it but for me especially lately like in, you know uh, since the fourth let's say trip of mine um i i started feeling that this is not only it's uh was like that's what the first thing that happens like this last time that i uh, smoked dmt i smoked a tiny little bit and it just made me remember what the DMT experience is, like the general kind of uh, territory. And and then I couldn't just go to bed after that. I thought, oh, I need to, I need to do the proper uh, experience now. And the reason I felt that I do need to do the proper thing now is because um, what the little tiny toke that I took reminded me of is this is already happening. It's just I'm in my ordinary state I'm not perceiving, you know, the reality of the situation, the gravity of the situation in a certain sense. And so after you kind of like peeked through the curtain to then go like, oh shit, yeah, there is this whole thing about what is happening at every second, but I'm not ready for that. I'm going to go to bed. That that didn't seem like, that seemed like chickening out. That seemed like willfully blinding yourself to the situation. So I, I did the, the full thing. And so I uh, thought about the metaphor of the cave recently, you know, because of this thing, I was thinking about the DMT experience and it does seem like, you know, a 15 minute expedition to the outside of the cave. But the problem is translating that stroll back into like, you return back. You don't right. like, or at least, you know, my, case is I go out every once in a while, maybe once uh, every year, maybe a couple times a year, I do my little walk and then I go back and then I have like stories to tell maybe, uh, but even those are not the real thing. It's very hard to put in words what, what is happening there outside. And more importantly, like to translate that, it does feel like this is, it's supposed to be relevant to everything that you do because it, you know, it, it sheds some light on just the general reality of the situation, like what is happening, what consciousness is, what the relationship between consciousness and matter is, what relationship between different people are. Yeah. But um, once the experience is over, you're back to your ordinary way of seeing things. And like this time around, I don't even have notes, really. I have one page of notes that I took, but before taking those notes, I sat on my couch for some time thinking, is it even worth trying to write things down? Because even during the experience, I felt there was this moment where I felt, okay, so this is really important. I need to make sure I remember this somehow or remember a, a part of it somehow. But, but the experience was such that it seemed like it's impossible to remember because the like the memory as a tool, like whatever 
categories the brain has or you know places to put things in that experience just doesn't fit into those boxes so you're not going to be able to put that experience into uh, your little storage you could maybe try to make a note based on the experience and save that but if you're doing that it seemed at the time and then you're not fully in the experience you're not paying immediate attention to what is actually happening the the supposedly very important thing and so there's this dichotomy there's there's this choice do i focus on remembering this or do i focus on actually experiencing this and i thought that an, another way of, of thinking about uh, that experience for me lately has been that of practicing a skill uh the skill being like being or living being alive um uh, being cognizant um and and the experience is like i'm practicing that the i'm i'm very emerged in the whole ex you know exercise of being a, a living thing during that experience and then the thing that this idea of holding on to this and uh, trying to remember and trying to write it down or something so that you can tell other people about it it's a little absurd because it's like i'm trying to learn to ride a bike or something if you're instead of paying attention to the body and to just like trying to make sure you you have uh, the balance right if instead of that you're focusing on okay how do i describe it to other people how do i what is this feeling how do i write it down you're not going to learn you're going to fall down and so it's like you need to pay attention to the experience itself and so my hope is and there's a little bit of a feeling of that you know post uh some of these experiences i do feel like i get better at things uh it's hard to make um a, like a direct causal link to say like I, I you know like a month after I have a good trip I write a good story or I make a cartoon or just more things are being done in the day it's hard to really claim that the trip was the cause of it but it does feel like you know that half an hour I really got kind of deep in just trying to get the process of being right and then I get back to my ordinary life and I still am and it does feel like I'm a little better at it now uh, and I didn't have to write it down I didn't have to mm, you know uh, represent the experience uh, to extract something out of it this is something I <clears throat> I've uh, struggled with myself you know I, I took uh, ayahuasca in 1999 as part of a book project uh rational mysticism that's a good so excuse something i could deduct from my taxes yeah. um, i went out to california uh, i was with a couple of experts on ayahuasca one of whom i i already knew and had, had interviewed uh the other i had read about so these are kind of authorities on ethnobotany and you know, getting high off plants and stuff like that. There were a bunch of other people. And, and so then, and I was there as a journalist, but I was also there as a human being to have this experience and something bad had happened in my family right before I'd left on the trip. This, this crow that was a member of our family had died and everybody was traumatized by it, especially my wife. A crow. So, yeah. I wrote about this in, at the beginning of rational mysticism, I was really so I was really dwelling on death. So I wasn't there just as a journalist. I was mm -hmm. there as a mortal human being. But then, you know, the, but I had my pad and paper with me while we're tripping. And, you know, we're outside. We're on this cliff overlooking the Pacific. It was spectacular scenery. We took this stuff at about 9 o'clock at night, 9 or 10. And then, you know, we're tripping all night. And um, even in the midst of my you know, the sort of most, uh, energetic visions. I'm, I'm thinking, uh, okay, what's going on here? How, you know, how, how can I describe this? I'm thinking like a journalist, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. in my case, I'm that's so ingrained in me. And I think it's, I, I think it's being a journalist is kind of a, um, I ended up as a journalist because I've always felt like an observer of my own life since I was a little mm -hmm. kid. Mm -hmm. I've always, which means it's a feeling of alienation, kind of standing back from things and thinking, what the hell is this? And so journalism came naturally to me as a way of just sort of, well, I'm going to try to write it down and describe it. And maybe I'll understand it then. Maybe other people will understand it. But it was kind of ludicrous because I'm, you know, first of all, it's dark. And second, at, at the peak of my trip, I'm hallucinating so much it didn't matter with my my eyes were closed or open. I'm, it's like the world is just boiling with all these crazy colors, and uh, and I'm so I'm trying to write stuff down and and not very not very successfully, but that actually helped me stay sane. I worried I was losing my mind at one point, and I felt mm. bad. I felt irresponsible. You know, I had two little children at home. And I thought, wow, this, I'm really fucked up. I mean, here I am. I'm like now uh, in my 40s, late 40s, and I'm, I'm still taking drugs like this. What the hell is wrong with me? But then I'm trying to write that down too. Um, and the, the watching, uh, definitely it disturbs the experience, as you say, and I think it probably diminishes it in some way, although there were times when the experience became so overwhelming that, uh, you know, I was totally in it. I wasn't observing mm -hmm. it anymore. Um, and then I had to rely on memory of what mm -hmm. had happened later. And that's what has happened. And that's so very that. flimsy. Yeah. Um, so, but I think it's possible, you know, you're an intellectual and you're a writer and you're an artist. So I think it's, from my perspective, it's essential for you to try to understand these things and to put them in language or pictures that other people can relate to. For me, I, I would assume for yeah. you, that's, that's what makes the experiences meaningful. I agree with that, that you need to share it. You need to find a way to, to do something with it so that other people can have access to it. And for yourself too, like maybe we'll get uh, into this metaphor of an individual psyche as a society. Uh, we talk about it every once in a while. Uh, if you look through that lens, then maybe there's like multiple agents there. And one of them is an observer. One of them is a journalist and the other one is an experiencer and they need to help one another. The experiencer needs to really uh, get into things and then the journalist needs to write it down, pay attention to it, uh, find ways to describe it, etc. Uh, I'm not really saying that, I mean, I always, my, my own practice up until this last one, I think, I mean, even with this last one, I did take some notes uh, after a period of um, uh, hesitation and pause. It's just, they were not really usable. It's just like a page of one liners. Yeah. just to remember certain points in the experience, just what I could um, bring back. Uh, but I think there's this tension. Like in that trip, I was, there were a few moments where I really felt the tension between like something is happening and part of my own understanding of what's happening at the time is uh, an understanding of a problem which has to do like my own problem which has to do with being stuck or being um you know not experiencing uh every moment fully like on 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 multiple levels there's the bodily level where it's like uh, there are muscles in my body that uh, are tense and never are relaxed and they need to move and th that's one part of what i i do uh, my my method of, uh, of of doing psychedelics, not exactly the McKenna method, where he he would say uh, you know five dry, dried gra five grams of dried mushrooms in a dark room lying down. I don't necessarily do that, but I do agree with him that uh, you know for me different people are different, but I 
don't really treat experiences where I'm with other people as a proper psychedelic experience because I get it, it, it becomes an experience uh, of communication. Девушка. That's my dog. Just staring back at me. This is this is a, a challenge. Communication with a different species. There's definitely some communication going on, but there are a lot of stumbling blocks here. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the, if, if I do drugs with other people, uh, it's the other people that are the focus of the, or not the other people, but our relationship, our communication, that is the focus of the experience. Yeah. Uh, so I can't really pay attention to the thing that's happening, and I can't be as free in my relationship to the thing because if I'm alone, uh, it's very lucky that there are no cameras around or other people witnessing the thing because I make weird noises and move around and it's, you know, I wouldn't be able to do that uh, with other people uh, in the room. And so one of the things that is happening is me like stretching the muscles that, that have been stuck and it, it, it's some of this is I, I wouldn't be able to do it like if I just decide let's do some stretching exercises there are certain muscles that I can't get to like I would need to find some kind of trainer to explain to me like uh, some I don't know a sequence of exercises to get to a muscle deep in in my back that uh, doesn't move with these drugs uh, I find that ability and because the experience um, has all of these levels in it, like I feel something in the body, it corresponds to the visions that I'm having at the time. It uh, is connected, the visions and the feeling in the body are connected to thoughts and ideas and uh, my view of the world and whatever else associations come about. And so when I'm in that moment, I'm realizing that I'm doing something now that I don't ordinarily do, and that's very important and good and healing. I, you know, some muscles are finally moving that should have been moving, you know, every day. There is something happening in my mind. You know, I get to places where I don't normally get and so forth. And that's very valuable. And that's like, I'm in the process of solving some of my problems right now. But at the same time, I'm thinking, you need to be remembering this. You need to be, you know, describing this and and I think some of the tension in the body and some of the neuroticism of thought and some of the limitations of thought and feeling and so forth come from this desire to describe it to put it in a box to you know put a handle on it instead of just experiencing the thing so there's a paradox here I'm Absolutely. finally I'm finally getting out of my own inhibitions and that helps me be healthier. Like my body uh, feels better. I, you know, there, there's that happening. And part of my reaction to that is like thinking, this is amazing. I need to, it's like that journalist comes back. The one who's probably been like a part of the reason this hasn't been happening the first 30 years. And, and he goes, I'm, okay, we need to write this down. We need to put a, you know, a handle on it. We need to put it in the box. And so that tension to me is definitely present in these experiences. And I don't have, um, you know, my own approach hasn't really taken shape yet fully, but I do agree with you that it's like, I guess m my, my experience now is more, my approach now is more like experience the thing and then think about it and then maybe draw or write things down or do do something as opposed yeah. to in the middle of it uh try to um put it in some kind of box for me it's almost not a choice but i a couple of things i wanted to say about this first of all i uh you know i've, I've seen some some people when we're talking about our psychedelic trips they go what the hell? Like, who cares? It's like people talking about their dreams and it, these are just drug experiences and you can't learn from them. And I totally understand that point of view, I, but I'll just say what, what I think is a value in, in, um, in tripping and drug experiences. For me, I, the, 
one of the things that I struggle with. Oh my God. <laughs> That's a very cute. My, my girlfriend, if she was here, she would say the cuteness, the cuteness that'd be capital letters. Um, he's restless because my girlfriend, uh, comes home at about this time and he, he's barking like, where the fuck is she? <laughs> anyway, habituation is, you know, our brains are designed to detect novelty and especially novelty that might be useful or mm -hmm. might be a threat to us. And I, I understand that it's very adaptive, but it, it means that we stop th seeing things after a while and we just, we're in our routines and we're sleepwalking through life. Um, and what drugs can do, what these psychedelics can do, they don't always do because you can get habituated to psychedelics too. It's, and I've seen that happen to people. I felt it happening to me. Um, but the and way they, that's a, that's a sad kind of a thing to observe. Yeah. I think you can become habituated to meditation and spiritual practices mm -hmm. of all kinds. Um, that's how habituation works. But the way it works for me is that it, it knocks me out of my ruts. And mm -hmm. so I, I'm, then I'm in a different place and I'm looking at where I was and it's all peculiar. It's unfamiliar to me. And I feel like I'm seeing it, seeing it for the first time. Um, or at least in a, in a very novel light. And I see things that I wasn't noticing and whether or not it's true for me is almost beside the point. I'm it, it's given me a fresh look at things. I right. think I was just thinking, uh, as you were talking that, and maybe this is because I, I just had my students read something by Oliver Sacks. Oliver Sacks is the great neurologist and, and writer, and he writes about people with really severe brain disorders. And, and what's brilliant ones. about, about Sachs is that he, you know, you're reading the man, I just had my students read one of his classic stories, the man who mistook his wife for a hat, mm -hmm. a guy who had a, I think it's a stroke and he can't distinguish humans from inanimate objects. Um, and, uh, you know, it's profound disorder, but sex describes these people in such a way that you start reflecting on your own ordinary consciousness and perceptions and your ways of interacting with and understanding reality and under other people. And you really realize how bizarre ordinary perception is. Um, so sex dehabituates you, right. um, with these stories. And I feel like, you know, if you want to put it in a derogatory way, taking drugs gives you these temporary brain disorders. So you're the man who mistook his wife for a hat for a little while. And, and then it makes you reflect on how you understand the world at all to the degree uh, that you do. And for me, these have been permanent changes in the way it led to permanent changes in the way that I perceive reality. One thing that's in interesting to me, going back to the metaphor of the cave is whether we just, there are all these different ways of seeing the world that we can access through, I don't know, peyote or DMT or something like that. And whether they can be ranked. I mean, when you're in the middle of a DMT vision, do you feel like this is closer to re to ultimate reality, mm -hmm. whatever that is? I understand that ranking, and I think that's what philosophers do. I think that's what Socrates was after with the metaphor of the cave. There's the level of ignorance, and there are you know different levels of ignorance, and then there's absolute knowledge somewhere up here. I'm not sure if I agree with that sort of ranking. Mm -hmm. I guess the older I get, the more I think, no, they're just, and actually we've talked about this. They're just different ways of seeing reality. And, um, and even that, you know, poor piranha and its aquarium has got its own little universe. Mm -hmm. I, 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 
I'm pretty sure that mine is better and richer and more detailed, more interesting than it. But who the hell knows from the from a really absolute, I don't know, divine, omniscient point of view, everything is equally far from absolute truth. And in that sense, you know, the most deluded person, member of QAnon, uh, just has a different point of view than mine. It leads to this kind of extreme relativism, mm -hmm. which my ordinary self rejects. I do think that there are worldviews that can be ranked in terms of truth, kind of down here in the ordinary world. But at some point, you get way up here, and everything really is just relative. I think there are two different things mixed up in here. One is your personal re relation to uh, the perspectives that are available to you, like your ordinary state of mind and what happens when you ingest some kind of a drug or uh, do a meditation retreat or go to, you know, spend some time in a flotation tank, whatever, perturb your consciousness in some way or, or calm it down uh, uh, to, to a level that is not ordinarily available to you. That's one thing. And then the other is uh, the relationship between perspectives of different people, which maybe you can marry this to you by saying that like if you take that um, view that all there is is consciousness, in like the individuals are are different ways of perturbing the universal consciousness. Like maybe the human being, an individual human being, can be seen as a drug. We're a complex laboratory that produces different chemicals, and they interact within the brain, and that's maybe like you and I are different trips of God. God is doing this one drug that's called Nikita and this different drug called John, and it, those are two different trips. Um, but, uh, you know, that's that's like uh, playing with metaphors. But on the practical level, those two uh, situations I do treat very differently. With my own experience, There are, with my own experience, the, the metaphor that works for me is that of geography. Like, you can go to, you can go to different places of your mind or, or of like the, the, the kind of, the, there's a landscape of experience and you can go there, you can go here and uh, there's no ranking. Uh, that's that's your choice or or circumstance somehow that uh, leads you to one place or another, and you can uh, figure out that some of these places you don't want to visit, and others you like a lot, and and maybe you'll find one where you want to build a house, you want to dwell in in that area. Leo. Yeah. And. Uh, <laughs> And uh, and then there are experiences like the DMT flash, which feel like like going from two D to three D. That's why they feel like uh, closer to some kind of ultimate truth. It's not that you get from one point that's far from the truth to a, a point that's closer to the truth. It's that you see your landscape that you ordinarily perceive. And then suddenly you're kind of like picked up and you notice, oh, there is like a whole other plane to this. We're a bunch of these planes. And uh, you just see it in a more full way. Um, like the the one one thing that always happens to me in, in these experiences is you, you, I notice the connections that are ordinarily not so apparent, like what I said just now with the body, the feelings in the body, and the uh, what's happening in the consciousness, the the interconnectedness of thoughts and experiences and ideas and uh, like all of these things, they feel like not even like different parts of the same thing, but more like the thing is contained in every element of it. There's this fractal quality to it. And so when I think, when I look at my thoughts or feelings, 
I'm seeing the same thing that I would see if I really paid attention to the like sensations in the body. It's just those are two different ways of representing uh, the experiences that consciousness is going through. Uh, and that is not not that easy for me to get a hold of in ordinary life. I know that you can get better or worse at it. Like meditation can help you notice the connections. You know, you start noticing um, the pain in your back that you're, you've been habituated to. And, and, and if you pay attention to uh, the sensations in the body as part of regular practice of meditation, you'll get better at noticing that thing and at noticing the connection between that and the mood stuff like that but it's not the same as like seeing it so vividly uh you know in a there's a, a very rich moving visual representation of the internet interconnectedness of all of your experiences that that doesn't happen to me every day can i can i uh, let me um so i this mutual friend of ours was hoping we'd talk a little bit about mm -hmm. ayahuasca and and i i haven't smoked pure DMT the way you have. So my only experience of DMT comes through ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is the main active ingredient. I mean, uh, DMT is the main active ingredient of, of uh, ayahuasca, which has all this other stuff in it as well. And I've taken ayahuasca, let me see, what is it, twice now? But the first time and was the most uh, intense experience. That's the one I describe in Rational Mysticism at great length. And, and at the peak of it, um, I sort of felt like it was the, a feeling that I jumped to a higher dimension and there was this, it was very mechanistic. I felt like there were all these moving parts and there mm -hmm. were also new colors, colors I had never seen before. And mm -hmm. they're all sort of moving around, interlocking and creating these new forms constantly and you know the journalist part of me or maybe i thought of this later i sort of felt like i descended way down into my own cognitive apparatus and it was sort of you know mind and brain at the same time but i'm going deeper and deeper and i'm looking at the way i described it later is the machine code mm -hmm. the raw machine code of my own consciousness and thinking and what was creepy about it was that it was so alien and also i had a, this other feeling and and apparently this is pretty common um for people who were who, who have done dmt there was a kind of overall personality to it that was mischievous not really malevolent but not nice you know, kind of mocking. And, um, and I was sort of impressed by it, but I didn't like it. And especially I didn't like thinking that I was seeing my own, my own mind at, at, at some really deep level. And so the takeaway for me, first of all, I just think that DMT doesn't suit me the way that psilocybin and LSD do. But the, uh, the takeaway was that there are certain visions that aren't useful to me, or they're they're almost too deep. They're too alien. Um, they're too hyperdimensional, and I'm I sort of need to live in this world here, where I'm a dad, I'm a teacher, I'm a husband, now an ex-husband, I got a girlfriend. Um, you know, I've got these human responsibilities and uh, and attachments. And this is the primary world of meaning for me. And so I sort of feel like I'm, I'm not as, as interested as I used to be in, in that kind of hardcore psychedelic vision. Um, and that, that's actually something that I tried to express in rational mysticism, that I was looking for these visions that would make sense of the entire world from some kind of cosmic view from nowhere, like a supreme objective view. And I just decided that maybe there is such a view, but um, it's not helping me live my life and be a happy person and be a, 
a, a decent friend and um, and colleague and boyfriend and father here in this here in this life. So I'm glad I've had those experiences. They do give me a kind of they help dehabituate me when I if I remember them. They like take me out of myself a little bit, and I look back at myself and go, "Oh yeah, no, this is still some strange shit going on." Um, Did you see when you were looking at that machine code of yourself? Did you find anything? Like, did you learn something about yourself from looking at that code? Like finding some patterns of behavior or something? For me, it was the the overwhelming feeling and conclusion was one of um, absolute coldness. Mm. And I I think, but I, I you know I'm projecting. And so I've always felt that on some level, I'm, I'm like, I am just an observer and that makes me very cold. Even when I'm in the middle of some really traumatic experience involving other people, mm -hmm. um, I'm part of me is just standing back and going, Oh, this is interesting. And often, you know, I'm such a, I'm such a bastard. I'm all, Sometimes I'm still in the experience and I'm thinking how I can turn it into a piece of writing. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, that. And that, that disturbs me about myself, but I sort of accept it also. That's interesting. You you, you talked about how the, the whole thing had a personality to it and, um, and it's mischievous. And the two uh, thoughts related to that that I have are, one, I've been thinking about maybe even writing something called reframing the DMT experience because um, it's gotten, you know, into the mainstream by now, uh, people not doing the drug, but uh, having an awareness of it and uh, having a set of ideas about it. And one of these ideas that's very strong is that you meet creatures there that are beings and that's what the whole thing is about. And that's not wrong. But in my experience, um, it's been a, my my view of that part of the experience has been evolving, and and I'm not sure if that's uh, the most helpful way to look at the thing uh, that you meet these beings there. Um, I'm I'm feeling more these days that having a personality or um, having a quality of an awareness of something that looks at things is part of the overall thing. So it's like, I'm an experiencer and I'm looking at this geography of consciousness or experience. There's this landscape of things happening. And one of the things about the thing that's happening is it's looking back at you. It's yeah. just a quality. It's like there are different qualities of of what is going on, and one of them is there's awareness. So it's not to me uh, lately. It's not that I'm meeting an other or the other. It's more that that you're able to see that the experience is looking back at you when you're looking at it. Sort of like Nietzsche's thing. Uh, you know, when you stare into the abyss long enough, the abyss stares back at you. Um, I didn't feel like it's an abyss. I didn't you know that those are not the words that I would use to describe that experience of mine? But it's like if you look at something long enough, uh, it's gonna look back at you. There's another quality there that I've been thinking about, which is I think that anything that you're experiencing is in some way experiencing you. Every, like one, one approach to that was, oh, I'm kind of rambling here. Um, there was this one trip that was uh, a Changa trip. That's uh, people refer to it as smokable ayahuasca. It's also a mix of herbs. Um, uh, one containing DMT, one containing uh, MIO experience. Uh, what do you call those? In inhibitors of MIO. And um, and I had, that, that was the only trip that I had where I felt angry at uh, those beings, those the, the feeling that the, there is a presence there. 
and uh, there were two trips separated by a little break and during the break i was like muttering to myself you assholes you think you can just do that and and it was this i guess coldness um that i didn't like about them it felt that there is my level of experience my ordinary level of experience and i'm you know going through things i feel love or i feel sorrow or there's you know shit's happening in my life that i think is so important and I'm trying to extract experience or meaning out of it. And then I felt that at the same time, in parallel to my world, there's this other world where these other beings exist and they're getting out of it. They're getting something out of it too. They're getting some, something out of my experience. And though my experiences with DMT were all very positive, I felt that they didn't really care about that. That was not an important part to them. It was more like whether whether they can get the thing that they're getting out of it uh, or not. And and if I was experiencing not finding meaning, uh, but instead I was uh, in severe pain or something, if they were still getting whatever they're getting out of it, they would be just fine with that too. And so I was angry at them and I put more chunk in my pipe and said, I'm coming back to you motherfuckers. We're, 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 this is not done. <laughs> um, but anyway, so later I was writing something. I wanted to write a thing about Scientology. And the idea was that there are ideas or ideologies or uh, systems of thought or things happening in the world where you wouldn't want to embrace them. Like Scientology, I have a pretty negative view of, uh, you know, people call it a destruct destructive cult. There is uh, abuse happening. There's family ties being broken. There are many bad things about it. And then it's very tacky on aesthetic grounds. You can also <laughs> have a problem with it. Uh, but I find it less less so these days, but there was a, a long time where I found it just fascinating because of the, of how many different things are intertwined there, the, how the totalitarian aspect of the social structure of this church works, uh, the, the history of it, how people are tricked into it, how people do get something out of it in terms of self-help and stuff like that. Um, the weird, weird mythology of it, the, how people are kind of led through a trajectory where at a certain point they're willing to accept the weirdest, tackiest worldview that's given to them at a certain level. Like you've gone through years of practice and spending money and now all your friends are people in the same cult. And then at that point you're told, here's what's really happening. And then there's a story about aliens that uh, were exiled on earth and then bombed with hydrogen bombs and that's supposed to be your reality now. How do you get there? Like there were all of these interesting things about it. And, and so I was going to write something about Scientology with the premise that some ideas you want to build a relationship with. Some ideas are good and you want to do something for the idea, express it in a good way. And then the idea will be good to you as well. Some ideas are, some ideas can be, they, they're not necessarily great as they are now, but you can elevate them. You can like, I was thinking about the flat earth view. Uh, we snicker at it, at it and we think this is really unfortunate that people, you know, believe something so silly, but you can look at it in a more charitable way and you can find an interpretation to that idea that would make it better. Yeah. You know, you can frame it as like, this is happening. It's already happening. There are people who are embracing that worldview. And so you can study it and look at it uh, with a warmer kind of perspective. And you can think that this is people trying to reclaim the direct experience. This is people trying to reject arbitrary authority. Uh, these are people who, or maybe this is a, a symptom of the education system not being uh, very good. 
you can find a way to express the idea that would be the, with the idea if it were alive would appreciate it like you did a good job of like you know painting it in a bigger light a better light mm -hmm. and uh maybe maybe it's going to be helpful generally maybe you know instead of people looking down and at flat earth believers maybe you'll build a little bit of a bridge maybe those people when reading your description of what they believe uh would be grateful and and it'll make them more understandable to others all of the stuff like that and then with scientology i felt i didn't want to elevate it i i think it's a harmful uh system but i thought there's so much meaning that can be extracted from it by studying it by looking at it uh its dynamics you can find something out about the patterns of human psyche about how control works about how um lying and invention of realities for your own sake work works and and so the idea was that i don't want to like directly engage with scientology i don't want to uh help it out but i can get something out of studying it and looking at it and um analyzing it and so i was writing that thing and suddenly i thought of that dmt that chunga trip where my problem with these entities was that they were getting something out of my experience and they didn't really care about my experience right they were using my uh going on for their own sake and i had a problem with that and so now i suddenly felt bad about my conceit <laughs> to do that with scientology um can i all right where i thought where i thought you were gonna go th this this whole idea of ideas becoming embodied and having personalities being in sentient and somehow i find really interesting i guess I, I still i have what is maybe a a trite view of this and and this is what one way i understand um you know, my own sort of DMT ayahuasca trip is that ultimately all those things are parts of myself. Mm -hmm. They're all reflections of, of what's going on in me. I, you know, I've, uh, one way I think about, um, the quest, the human quest for knowledge, and this comes especially from physics and cosmology, which is trying to understand the totality of the universe and is looking back into time and trying to find the origin of time, the origin of time and space. And, um, you know, one person who did this in an incredibly imaginative, but also rigorous way was a physicist named John Wheeler, who's this amazingly, uh, creative thinker, but also was one of the, one of the, uh, early, um, developers of quantum mechanics. And uh, it seemed to me that when you, you get to the, you're looking down into matter, you're looking for answers further and further down below electrons, below quarks, below super strings, whatever. And then you're also looking out at the borders of the universe. So you, uh, mm -hmm. you're looking in the both directions and you're expecting to find some kind of answer at the end, like God or whatever. And the, the paradox of, of physics, and this is something that Wheeler expressed very clearly and he wrestled with, is that ultimately we're, we're seeing our own reflections everywhere. We go down, down into the Planck scale, which is the, you know, the, the scale of physics where everything is supposedly unified and from which time and space emerge and there's our own face looking back at us. We look at the, into the, you know, at the origins of the microwave background, which is the afterglow of the big bang. We're trying to see what was there at the moment of first moment of creation of the universe, you know, billions of years before humanity, humanity even existed. That's our own face looking back at us. Um, can you so, put a finer point on it? Like 
say at the micro scale our face looking back at us is is what exactly how does that work that it, it's that we realize that it's the tool that we're using to measure things we're, we're seeing more about that than about the thing we're trying to measure part of this comes from quantum mechanics so there's this peculiar um aspect of quantum mechanics that says that um that that when we when we try to when we actually observe things uh, as opposed to just modeling them uh with our theories then um we make them take a certain form um and it's the act of observation that does that so what wheeler said the way he put this is that maybe reality is participatory that reality comes out of a kind of interaction of our selves our minds our consciousness with physical with the physical realm but we somehow define uh the physical realm with the questions that we ask of it and mm -hmm. it's it's very close to a kind of idealism which says that consciousness is the primary substance of the universe and um and what's upsetting about that for a lot of people and for me when i first sort of figured out what wheeler was really saying and i think it was upsetting to wheeler too is that it suggests that you know we spend all this effort looking for something and i think a lot of it is looking for god or for some ultimate order and we we keep coming back to ourselves and that that is you know maybe that's profound but it's also kind of deflating and so all the ideas that you're describing that are alien and that I've encountered uh, that seem like totally foreign to me are just expressions of my own self. That's all that there is. Um, there's this scene in the second Star Wars film. It's really iconic uh, scene where Luke is um, Luke Skywalker. He's being trained by Yoda and he goes into some cave and he's going to face his, his greatest fear. And there in the cave is uh, Darth Vader, who's kind of ghostly. And Darth Vader comes out with his lightsaber and, and Luke is uh, fighting him with his life's lightsaber. And then Luke finally kills him and takes Darth, Darth Vader's masks off, mask off. And it's Luke. It's very mm -hmm. hokey. But it's also really powerful. And it to me, it it expresses this idea that all the monsters out there, all these other things out there that we encounter in our trips to the beyond through science or through mysticism, um, it's all reflections of our own selves. And, um, and in a way that is terribly disappointing but in another way it's it's sort of comforting and um and profound i guess that is what i was trying to get to i think it's i think about it a little less in terms of what should we call it personalities uh like there's me and there's the other thing and i'm, I'm thinking more in terms of the experience uh, but it's like, if I am, how do I put it? Like, if there's a fight happening, then both, both members of the fight are doing the fighting, right? It, it's kind of like the, I, I, somebody sent me an image. Uh, I've never read, uh, what's it called? Be Here Now by Ram Dass, but somebody sent me a scan of a page from there and it said some like cops and the hippies, uh, create one another. If there's a dichotomy, if there's an, a subject and an object, uh, they are connected by the experience of the subject, like witnessing the object, for example. But really what's happening is the witnessing, is the relationship be between the two things more than the actual two things. So my story about Scientology was um, I felt that I shouldn't be trying to do that thing of just extracting meaning coldly out of something happening because I didn't like it when that was happening with me uh, in that DMT trip. And then 
what was happening, one way of looking at what was happening in that DMT trip is I was doing the drug in order to learn something, to observe. And so what I was witnessing is not like an evil foreign entity that was trying to get something out of my experience. It was what was happening. Like I was doing the drug in order to observe the effects and study something. And, and so it, what I was seeing it was the visual representation of this process that I myself was engaged in, which it was this like trying to extract meaning out of experience um, in a detached kind of way. Yeah. And then I guess another part of that experience was me saying, fuck you, that's not right, <laughs> like that. And so there's this like, uh, adjusting of your own approach of your own method, but like one, uh, adjustment like that, that I've been witnessing in myself is, uh, I guess a step away from that cold kind of, I don't know, like that example with Scientology was, I don't want to put anything down, you know, like even the things that I see as really problematic. I don't want to look down on them um, and and snicker at them and uh, and say, well, this is an evil person. I want to understand what is happening in a more compassionate way. That makes you very that makes you very saint like. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm keeping it. I'm keeping an eye on uh, on the time. I'm going to have to go soon. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's my lunch time. But I, I will say that. I think one thing that makes, you know, I, I, uh, James Joyce, one of my favorite writers, is because he has, he loves the totality of human experience. Mm -hmm. He's not a snob the way so many writers are. So many writers rank people, you know, the, the knowledgeable, the smart, uh, the good versus the ignorant and, and the bad. Um, Joyce loves the whole grand spectacle of humanity with all what we would call ignorant and wise and, and, uh, and good and evil. And he, and he, you know, he sort of, his heart goes out to everybody, but he also is smiling the whole time. Yeah. Um, and that seems to me to be a, um, you know, something to aspire to. I think it's what you're, I think it's what you're expressing. Uh, and, and it's, um, it's something I aspire to. I, 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 you know, I can be very judgmental and I get irritated by certain people. And I do think that they are bad ideas, but I, I agree with you that, I think ultimately wisdom would consist in loving it all, even the Scientologists. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's something about that call that that's still, I, it's been a while since like I watched the documentary or read something about them, like really immerse myself into that world. But every time that I do, there's something fascinating about that whole enterprise there. Uh, there's, I'm just, again, I just, don't want to be looking down on that. Uh, it's all humans engaged in the human thing. We're all, there's and, a uh, there is a kind of anarchist um, comedy troupe when I was growing up. This is be the late '60s and early '70s called Fire Sign Theater hmm. that that produced these uh, skits that were like. Uh, uh, parodies of old fashioned radio shows with, um, you know, with sort of all these goofy characters. And I think their most famous album was called We're All Bozos on This Bus. <laughs> Do you know that's nice? Bozo, yeah. So, and I, I, I like that's always stuck in my head. We're all bozos on this bus. Yeah, we're that's all a good one. Equally, yeah. We're, on some level, we're all equally deluded. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to let you go, but I wanted to do one, uh, one last thing, which is 
so the reason we wanted to talk about ayahuasca today was that David Poleski, our common friend uh, from Seattle, an artist, a really like, I mean, he's one of my favorite artists, just period, generally, like uh, of all the paintings that I've seen, his speak to me more than uh, more than most. Um, and I wanted to, I think I'm going to put like, as I'm speaking right now on the video, I'm, I'll put some of his work up because uh, I really like it and I want to share it. And the other thing that I wanted to say is how grateful I am for uh, for being able to do this thing, like these conversations between you and me, uh, the newsletter that I do. Both of these things don't have a huge audience, but it's uh, amazing how doing this thing, like... Uh, being engaged in any kind of creative work and sharing it and then being engaged in conversation with other any kind of like you know public exchange of of uh, perspectives leads to more connections to finding more people uh and uh like david is an example of that he you got me connected to him he originally i guess read uh, your book mind body problems and wrote you a letter and you published that letter and in the letter there was a painting that I saw and I really liked. And because of that, we had a conversation here on this channel, we, we, we talked and then uh, we had more private conversations and we still exchanged letters every once in a while. And now I have this weird friendship with an old bus driver slash artist slash ex clown. He, he used to be a very uh, successful mime in the Seattle area uh, in you know in America I'm here in Russia people from different generations different countries different cultures uh, there's a connection and uh, the same thing is happening like with that newsletter people write me letters and those are meaningful those are actual you know human beings sharing for example you know something something about how they did psychedelics and what ha happened to them and some of those include lines like, you know, this was very long, but I hope you don't mind because I don't really have anybody else with whom I can share these experiences and talk these experiences through. And so being a part of this kind of ongoing conversation, uh, these this network of relationships where people inspire one another, where people share meaningful experiences with one another. Uh, this is very, very helpful and just, you know, I'm really, I'm really happy that it's happening. The point of that, the reason I wanted to say all of that is to uh, encourage anybody who's listening or, or watching this to do that. Like you don't have to, you know, this video is probably going to be watched by a few hundred people, maybe a thousand. That's not a lot of people. That's like if we're aiming for media success, we're far from that. But if we're aiming at making connections with other humans and uh, advancing our own lives in just like being able to articulate our experience, being able to share uh, something and to get something, you know, for me to hear your experiences and exchange thoughts, that is a great tool. That's a That's a very... It, it's very available. Like nowadays, everybody has a camera in their laptop. Uh, and and a lot of people that you're like, I don't know, you you read like what David did with you. He read the book by somebody he doesn't know and he thought, I'm going to write them a letter. That's that's something we should be doing more. <laughs> that's, that's something that a lot of people, you know, shy away from or thinking, you know, what do I have to say? And... Um, I want to encourage anybody who's listening to this to do more of that. Write letters, talk to people in person or on Skype, put those things, um, you know, put something up online for anybody to come across because then uh, the chances of you making a connection you would never predict get higher and there's, uh, there's value in that. Uh, well said. I mean, this is... <laughs> This is one of the best outcomes, aspects of, of being a writer and 
by the way, David's art, I love it. I've got a bunch of mm-hmm. it in the, and I have a discussion section at the end of mind body problems, which is all online. And, um, and I, I've got some of David's art because it express expresses. I feel like he's taken snapshots of my soul. I, he expresses somehow, um, these feelings I, I have of sort of drifting through life. I mean, he's a real mystic, but his paintings are beautiful. Yeah. Um, and comforting somehow. Uh, so yeah. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I hope we keep doing this. It's, it's really been fun for me too. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. And so, you know, two weeks down the road, yeah. we'll do another one. Sounds good. All right. Have a good lunch then. Okay. Thanks, Nikita.